she stood trembling and tired, but wholly triumphant, high in the treetop. Yes, there was the sea, with the dawning sun making a golden dazzle over it, and toward that glorious east flew two hawks with slow moving pinions. There's Blunder Pond and Bluffer Pond, Molasses Pond and Bean. There's Scraggly Lake and Ragged Lake. There's Silver, Clear and Green. All I could see from where I stood was three long mountains and a wood. I turned and looked another way and saw three islands in a bay. So with my eyes, I traced them. For 50 years, the Maine Women Writers Collection has collected the work of the state's most distinguished women writers and documented the experiences of ordinary women living in the northeast corner of the United States. Housed at the Portland campus of the University of New England, the collection is unique and valuable for the breadth of the work and the deep sense of place captured in more than 7,500 books, manuscripts, photographs, personal papers, and other materials. The collection began in 1959 at Westbrook Junior College, then Maine's only all-women's institution of higher education. In that day, it was more like intellectual finishing school than it is now. We had a lot of rules and regulations. You had to dress for dinner every night. The college offered programs in traditionally female fields such as secretarial work and fashion design. At that time, women's experiences were largely discounted or ignored by academics and literary critics. So it was a bold act by English professor Grace Dow and college administrator Dorothy Healy to conceive of a collection focusing on women. Grace Dow taught English at Westbrook College for 21 years. By 1959, she had become chair of the Department of Language and Literature. Uh, Grace Dow was on the faculty when I came back there to teach, and she was a quiet, unassuming woman who was a wonderful teacher. She inspired many people. Dorothy Healy joined the secretarial faculty in 1936. By the 1950s, she was working in the president's office on admissions and public relations, teaching an English class, editing a campus magazine, and involving herself in just about every other aspect of college life. She gave everything she had to any project or to any cause or to any individual with whom she became involved. Her energy level was amazing. It was. Yes. Well, she had a wonderful sense of humor. I knew her only as, uh, as somebody the students loved at the, at the, at the campus. And, she, you know, when I'd uh, go and, and call on my, uh, on my girlfriend, I would uh, see Dorothy there. And I, I got a hunch she was vetting the young men that came around the campus, too. In 1959, Healy invited Dow to accompany her English novel class on a field trip to Colby College to see the Thomas Hardy collection there. On the return trip, Dow suggested starting a collection of Maine women's writing at Westbrook College. The two women met with college president Edward York Blewett the next day, and he was enthusiastic. I had noticed that suddenly some person who nobody has noticed will become into prominence, mm -hmm. uh, even for, for writing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, uh, before things are lost entirely, it would be a good idea 
to uh, get together all that we can. And Grace was responsible for the idea and how, but Dorothy was really the front person that it. So it was a perfect coming together with of an idea and somebody who could make it work. The collection began with a $400 budget and an ambitious goal, to preserve and provide access to writing, letters, and memorabilia by Maine women writers who were famous, such as Harriet Beecher Stowe and Rachel Carson, as well as those who were more obscure at the time. It was one of the first collections of its kind in the country. What was vital and key to the formation of the collection was the deep friendship of Dorothy Healy and Frances O'Brien. Frances O'Brien was Portland's man of letters. And he was a superb historian. And he was a rare book dealer of legendary renown. In 1959, Dorothy purchased over 500 volumes, rare and valuable, from Frances O'Brien. Over the next three decades, she curated the treasure trove with the advice of uh, Francis O'Brien and sometimes his collaboration in purchases. In the 1950s and thereabouts, uh, literary critics did not take women's writing seriously. There just was no um, real acknowledgement that women had anything to say, that they had written anything of value, uh, or that they were writing anything of value. And that's one of the reasons why it's so significant that Grace and Dorothy realized they, we should be collecting this work. And somebody told me it was founded and established in 1959, which was not yet uh, the heyday of feminism. It was before the so-called second wave of the women's movement produced so much feminist theory that would allow us to analyze and understand collections like this one. So the people who founded it were obviously had great uh, foresight and fabulous uh, historical and critical imaginations. The collection grew to include works by lesser known women writers. One was Maine's first novelist, who went by the name Madam Wood. Others included Anne Sophia Stevens, a pioneer of the dime novel, and Margaret Jane Mussey Sweat, a 19th century novelist and travel writer. Sally Saywood Barrel Keating Wood. Luckily for the printers, her name was shortened as a name of respect, Madam Wood. Madam Wood. Uh, she wrote in her lifetime five novels. In the Maine Women Writers Collection, we are honored to have three of those novels, very, very rare. She wrote gothic novels, novels of terror, suspense, intrigue, you know, wills lost, threatened incest, rape, uh, mistaken identity, all those wonderful plot lines. And so she didn't put a name on such a book. She would uh, say, by a lady of Massachusetts, even though she always lived in Maine, or 1827, the first time she put by a lady of Maine. Dorothy Healy made it her vocation and avocation to get to know literary families. She became acquainted with the family of Josephine Peary, who was married to Admiral Robert E. Peary, who discovered the North Pole. And ultimately, the family gave Josephine's collection to the Maine Women Writers Collection. Peary was an extremely, I would say, headstrong, independent thinker, literate woman, uh, generous, loyal, devoted, passionate person. And the fact that Josephine Peary had written about her experiences on the expeditions, including giving birth to her daughter above the Arctic Circle in 1893, was as captivating to society at that time as the astronauts going to the moon in 1968 has been to our generation. Tuesday, September 12, 1893. Woke up at 5 a.m. not feeling well. Comfortable most of forenoon. 
little girl, born 6.35 p.m. I'm glad ma'am did not see me, but wish she were here now. Sunday, September 17th. Doctor says I'm to stay in bed at least two weeks. Don't think I will. September 23rd. I'm glad I have plenty of milk for baby. I give her half a can of condensed milk in 24 hours to get her used to the bottle in case anything should happen to me. Dorothy Healy also befriended the poet and writer, May Sarton. May Sarton's writing is significant for a number of reasons. Of course, her skill with literature, her very deep background, and her subject matter, I believe, the subject matter uh, uh, of women living their own lives. Healy and Sarton uh, corresponded a great deal. They planned a number of conferences and ultimately Sarton bequeathed a large portion of her literary estate to the Maine Women Writers Collection. My 80th year was really quite a glorious one. I mean, they had this wonderful conference at Westbrook. Coming into 80, I slow my ship down for a safe landing. It has been battered, one sail torn, the rudder sometimes wobbly. We are hardly a glorious sight. The connection with May Sarton helped put us on the map, so to speak, and having people want to have their papers uh, with us. Uh, one of the treasures that, that appeared to be mostly junk when it first came in were two or three and uh, black trash bags. When I opened these up, I must say I was a little dismayed because there was evidence of mice in them. I found that these were the records of an extended family connected with Blanche Willis Howard, mm -hmm. the writer. And there was information about her, there was her will, there were news clippings, there were diaries from her trips. There were records of her family living in New York. One of her nieces was an actress, so you get insight into what acting was like at that time. And it was just this marvelous, marvelous collection. The women's movement of the 1960s and 70s raised the profile of the Maine Women Writers Collection. But the push for women's equality also threatened the future of Westbrook College. As more colleges opened their doors to women, the all-female institution struggled to find its niche. In 1973, Westbrook College began accepting male students. Four years later, the Joan Whitney Payson Gallery opened on campus. John Payson, spouse of a Westbrook Junior College alumna, established the gallery to hold the world-renowned collection of Impressionist art that once belonged to his mother. By the 1980s, Westbrook College had expanded its offerings to include four-year liberal arts degrees. But despite new buildings, programs, and a rich campus arts life, the college's enrollment was declining 
a problem facing many small colleges nationwide. And the administration's plans didn't mesh with those of the art gallery. We were very concerned about uh, the future of the, of the art collection there and were negotiating with the college to move it. Uh, at the same time, uh, I came to realize that uh, the Maine Women's Writers Collection was also in jeopardy. Uh, we, uh, after quite a period of negotiating, uh, we were having a meeting uh, at the Governor's Club in West Palm Beach. Uh, attorneys were present, and the then uh, board chairman talked me into going into the hall with him without lawyers present. They wanted me to leave some money behind. John Payson donated a significant endowment to Westbrook College, money that came from his sale of the Van Gogh painting, Irises. The endowment ensured that the Maine Women Writers Collection would remain intact at Westbrook College. It funded a professorship in literature named after Dorothy Healy, academic conferences, and many other activities. The collection has grown over the years to include everything from works by literary greats to diaries, cookbooks, account ledgers, suffrage banners, and porridge bowls. When you have finished a good, big ironing, even with a mangle, you don't bring to writing a poem the same fresh outlook and uncluttered imagination that you might if you had been walking on a beach. Time, actual physical time, three or four hours. It takes energy, and there is always some detail ahead. Start supper. What's evolved over time is that there's become more of awareness of the treasures that are here uh, for the ordinary woman. I can remember buying a diary that someone had found in an attic in Newburyport, Massachusetts, and come to find out that woman had been born in Walderboro and taught in Walderboro. So you got some real insight into everyday life and farming country. So if you take the novels and the poems and then you put them with the social history, then you have a really strong, strong collection. In 1996, Westbrook College merged with the University of New England in Biddeford, Maine, creating a larger and more diverse institution of higher learning. The merger brought stability to the college and the collection. I became aware of the Maine Women Writers Collection when I first took a look at Westbrook College during the period in which we were discussing a potential merger. I thought this was a jewel. We did several important things to help this collection thrive. First and foremost, we raised the, uh, the budget dollars to see that we could expand the space, that we could redo the space, uh, make it appropriately climate controlled. And of course, we hired the curator and we expanded the staff. Dorothy had um, informal records for the collection. And I can remember she said to me one time, if you give me enough time, I can find anything in these rooms. What we needed to do was get that information that resided in her head out onto paper, into computers. So what we began to do was to um, put in place standard archival procedures to preserve conserve the materials. The collection's prominence grew in 2005 with the acquisition of more than 500 items once owned by the 19th century novelist and short story writer Sarah Orne Jewett of South Berwick. The thing that to me is most meaningful is that it includes several letters between Sarah Orne Jewett and Annie Fields, letters that were hitherto um, unknown among scholars. And these letters shed a lot of light on the relationship between those two women. The very close relationship that they shared began earlier than scholars might have been aware before this time. Dear Annie, I know that life is very hard for you. 
I think it is meant we should help each other and love each other more and more. Good night, dear, and God bless you and comfort you. Yours always and always, Sarah Orne Jewett. By the 50th anniversary of its founding, the Maine Women Writers Collection had become one of the most significant libraries of women's writing in the United States and a valuable resource for the study of women's lives. In my research recently into the murder of Mary Bean, a Sacco factory girl, I used the Maine Women Writers Collection to look at similar pieces to set the murder accounts into a broader context. And one piece I found here was a piece entitled The Murdered Maiden Student, which was a long poem about this poor uh, young woman who was cruelly killed on her way to school. The Murdered Maiden Student shows us that in the 19th century, there were lots of concerns about women being in public, whether they were on their way to school or on their way to work. The caution was they could end up dead. My particular project that I'm working on is republishing a new edition of Dorval. It was published in 1801, and it has never been reprinted since that time. That I feel a sense of responsibility to my young women that I teach in my college classes to show them strong women from other eras. And Aurelia, in Sally Wood's novel Dorval, is the best example I can find of a strong survivor. Part of the joy is the intellectual discoveries of finding things that I didn't know existed, but also part of it is the emotional connection um, that allows me to feel a connection with someone like Sally Wood. I've had the opportunity to see her daguerreotype, which is here in the collection. It's the only photographic image of Wood that exists, and in that sense is an invaluable scholarly resource. Sometimes the archives raise more questions than they answer, but that's part of the fun of going on a research trip like this. It's a treasure hunt. So then to see them here as slides, so they're luminous in a different way, and then colored is just really, really amazing. Classes at the University of New England draw on the resources of the Maine Women Writers Collection. All right, I want to welcome everyone here to our culminating event, and I want to thank you for joining us. My name is Jessica, I'm a dental hygiene student here at UNE. We have this wonderful Maine Women Writers Collection here at the university that we're able to use and have at our fingertips, and there is no anthology, so um, we decided, got in advance, that our solution for the course was that we were going to create one. This author exploration has become more of a personal quest than a class project for me because I've been so intrigued by Ruth Moore as a person. I've found many ways in which I can relate to her even though we are generations apart and living in completely different times. Oh my god, I think that Helen Nearing is my new hero. I love her stuff and I suppose we could give Scott some credit too, which is her husband. I didn't want him and I didn't need him. Community members come to the Maine Women Writers Collection to learn about the craft of writing and to hone their own skills. What I really am interested in is people who, are, who have come to the edge. They're, they're open in a way that's different. I'm interested in how women do it. And um, so that's so far what I've written. I love being edited because, I mean, you spend a lot of time alone with your work. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's, it's lonely work. And if somebody likes it enough to spend the time to look at it and read it closely and think about how to make it the best thing it can be, like, I don't quite get this. I think we need to know more about this. Um, I don't know if you need this chapter sometimes. You know, that's a big, you know, no wonder this book is so small. Um, you know, <laughs> but, um, so you need somebody else's eye on it. And it's very, um, it's gratifying. It's a I see it, it's a compliment to the work. But 
So I thought tonight we'd work on dialogue. Um, I guess rule number one is dialogue is not conversation. Right? You don't write everything that someone says because that's really boring. So my example is... The Gathering of Writers is the uh, weekly writers group uh, that we have here at the Maine Women Writers Collection. What's the most important thing to me, I would say, for coming you know, to the gathering is the fellowship being around other writers and being in an environment that's supportive and discussing the work because that's really what it's all about. There's been an enormous change in the way I view the possibilities for myself as a writer. Because, my little darling, you haven't learned what you need to learn about you yet. Yeah, it's really hard to write telephone conversations because nothing happens, right? Yeah. You know, there's all this fireworks in her head. Um, the end of, of all the things she does and all the things... Students come in here and they look around and here's a place that celebrates writers. The sense of purpose that students have writing here is just so much stronger. They, you know, you know they sit on Sarah Orange Jewett's couch or uh, touch Edna St. Vincent Millay's nightgown or they you know, see Ruth Moore's typewriter and they just feel a part of that heritage. So many of my um, participants are female. They're often of a generation who hasn't had that opportunity or that privilege or that permission to write. And, and I think you know, May Sarton sitting over looking at them uh, over their shoulder gives them that sense of it's okay. <laughs> In comparison to 1959 when this collection was founded, the view of women's writing has changed almost done a 180. The field of women's writing is absolutely legitimate now. It's populated by some of the most elite and well-respected scholars. There's always going to be a place for a collection like this because not only because we've committed to holding these items in perpetuity, making them available, preserving them, but also because uh, there's no substitute for holding the book in your hand, for holding the letter in your hand, for moving your finger along the page or along the spine of a book. Uh, and you can get that here, and you will always be able to get that here. What's unique about the Maine Women Writers Collection is its focus on Maine, but beyond just a geographic location, we get the depth of women's lives. Women who went to sea, women who went to the Arctic, young girls who went to school, women who traveled beyond the boundaries of Maine and then reflected back on what it meant to live here. You get a sense of the community of women who have formed a special history over time and who have related to each other in a certain area, confronting the same kinds of problems, always learning from each other, I think, probably always working together. Being invited to join the Maine Women Writers Collection has changed my life. I feel now, as I did not before, that I am part of a chain. Sarah Orne Jewett and Harriet Beecher Stowe and Edna St. Vincent Millay, all these incredible people that I think of now as my spiritual grandmothers. And here I am in the chain, and decades, many decades hence, I hope somebody will come in and find my work and think of me as her spiritual grandmother. It's, it's honestly very profound. My parents were wise. They knew my fondness for stories. Since I was a tomboy, and loved to roam the woods and swim the streams rather than do homely household tasks, they would persuade me to do my chores in exchange for stories. So many hours were spent picking berries, braiding sweetgrass, weaving baskets, chopping wood, or shoveling snow. And in return, I gathered many a tale of my people.
the state of Maine, the land of the bluest skies, the greenest earth, the richest air, the strongest, and what is better, the sturdiest men, ah, and the fairest, and what is best of all, the truest women under the sun. 